I'm Fran Ligler. I'm the Navy's Senior Scientist for Biosensors and Biomaterials. Um, I'm also currently the Chair of the Bioengineering Section of the National Academy of Engineering. I, at the lab, I run a soft money research effort to make uh, new capabilities that harness the functions of biomolecules, microfluidics, and other technologies to make sensors and new materials. Would you describe what the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering does? The center combines people with different disciplines and we use biological molecules to build new devices or new um, sensors to um, and integrate it with a variety of different kinds of hardware, both electrical and optical. Um, so they, the projects in the, sensor, in the center include everything from biosensors to artificial muscles for uh, underwater robots to um, antiviral and uh, therapeutic efforts. So it's a wide variety, of, but there's an awful lot of sensors activity in it. And the people include are from every discipline under the sun in science and engineering. What are the biggest challenges remaining to be addressed by biosensors? I think making them user-friendly and actionable. So I think we have, to, we have to build biosensors that give us the right information, not just information that people are interested, that laboratory scientists are interested in. So they have to have the right sensitivity, they have to ha be fully automated, kind of sample in, user out, or answer out type uh, footprints um, that can be used by ordinary people. And at that, much like the glucose sensors are for diabetes right now, um, that's a good example of one, but they need to be applied to uh, monitoring the environment for, uh, in to include energy harvesting so they're self-powered. Um, all of those kinds of aspects have to be integrated into them. Microfluidics has generated a lot of attention recently. What kinds of things has it made possible? Microfluidics has made possible much faster uh, results in terms of obtaining a detection event or quantitative information about whatever is being analyzed. Uh, because you can, it's, you can interrogate a much smaller volume, you can use much uh, lower reagent amounts, that decreases the cost. And in many cases, you can actually measure changes as they occur in real time, which is very difficult to do in much larger systems. Um, there are a lot of challenges left to be addressed in terms of microfluidics. Uh, people really need to develop a better understanding of when you need them and when you don't um, in terms of dealing with real world samples for analysis. Uh, microfluidics always have a problem of clogging if you put something big in there. There's also an issue of the materials used for microfluidic systems. Um, a lot of people use PDMS for prototyping. That's not a very good manufacturing material. There's also issue with microfluidics in plastics because of the changes in the plastics over time, which are not well characterized. The manufacturers generally don't tell you what's in the plastics you're using, and there, there are changes with time. So we really have to learn to deal with the surfaces that we create uh, in microfluidic systems, um, as well as some of the manufacturing issues and making large quantities of microfluidic systems. What's the importance of the military research labs to technology transfer and the commercial marketplace? It's a two-way street. Um, it's very important for the military these days to be able to buy the technology they need from industry. And yet, quite often, there's no impetus for industry to build something for the military market, which tends to be pretty erratic. So the, the military labs have the opportunity to address the development of technologies for military critical applications. At the same time, um, they may also demonstrate applications for civilian, uh, to meet civilian needs. The applications for civilian needs gives industry a market that's perhaps more sustainable while they make a device that then the government can buy back for their own specific applications. The Navy, at least in my personal experience, has been very non-greedy in terms of licensing 
its technologies. They have some very wonderful technologies that was developed with applications in mind. So it's very practical technology and valuable technology. And if we can find a corporate partner, the general demand is for a reasonable business plan and a reasonable understanding of the market. And the effort is to make licensing terms match that market. Um, we're not trying to fund our um, future endeavors you, off that, those licensing fees, as many universities are trying to do. How has the landscape changed for women in science since you started your career? Well, when I first started looking for a job, I had three offers from three different departments in medical schools. And it was turned down because I was a female PhD and it was against their policy to hire a female PhD as a formal policy. So uh, that would no longer happen. Um, those kinds of things don't happen. I would say the biggest thing that's changed is that men have gotten used to having us around. Um, it's no longer, I'm no longer looked at with shock if I walk into an engineering meeting. Um, and I think that's a very good thing. I think there are other minority groups that are having those same problems now that we had 20 years ago, but uh, for women it's getting better and better. Um, and it's less and less of an issue. That does put the challenge on us to, um, you know, it's not a matter of uh, people assuming you're really good if you're female and you survived, because now, you, now it's much more of an even playing field. And uh, so you have to step up to the plate and do good work.